This comes from Patrick. He says, I am lost. Four months ago, I came across your site and was convinced that the Bible is true. I've been reading the Bible ever since and seem to be getting nowhere. My prayers in the beginning seemed to be genuine, but now I have been praying and asking Christ to save me, and it seems my heart is hardened now to the point that my prayers are extremely weak. I try to be as honest as I can to Him, capital H, but I can't seem to break through. It may be because I still run to sin. But I'm not sure how to run to Christ. Please help. How to run to Christ? That's his question. How do I run to Christ? Four months he's come to believe that he's lost. And by the way, just because you come to believe that you're lost is no guarantee that things will get better. A lot of people come to realize that they're lost. They don't make it to glory. But he wants help. I mean, think, think in your own minds if somebody asked you that question. How do I run to Christ? How do I run to Christ? And you know, this, this is not an uncommon question. It, it seems like it, it seems like this is a common problem where you get people who they get to the place where they're frustrated. They get to the place where they've, they've tried to talk to as many people as they possibly can, and they seem to be, they seem to be miserable. They seem to be searching for something and they'll, they'll keep asking, they'll keep asking. They're looking, it's almost like they're looking, well I'm sure, they're looking for somebody to tell them something new. Something that they haven't heard already. How do I run to Christ? How do I run to Christ? And you know if you think, think about the invitations in Scripture. Is, is it even as though you get a lot of detail of, about how to run to Christ? Or does Scripture generally just say, run, go, come, drink? I mean, listen to some of the invitations of Scripture. Matthew 11.28, very well known. But listen to Christ. Come to Me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's it. Come to Me. That's what Christ says. He, he, does, he doesn't say how to come in the sense that you go this way and then you go that way and you go that way and I'm over there. He, t he tells us how to come as far as the state of our heart, right? He doesn't tell us the direction for our feet. Come. And if we think about it, where is He? I mean, He's close to every one of us. Don't we find a truth like that in the Bible? He's near all of us. He's here. There's nowhere the sinner can go where he's not. If you make your bed in hell, he's there. If you go into the depths of the ocean, he's there. You go up to the highest mountain peak, he's there. So, come is come really a matter of, of movement? 
is come a geographical thing, like he's over there and I have to go from here to there? I mean, what does is, what is come mean now? What's the sense? Come unto me. But he's here already. So what does that mean? That's not a matter of distance. It's not a matter of physical travel. Oh, well, there was a day when he walked this earth and if I, if I was going to find him, if I was going to go to where he was, it might be like blind Bartimaeus who, who had to track him down and he had to yell and there was a place he was physically, but that isn't the case anymore. What is, come doesn't mean anything physical now. It, it has nothing to do with our posture. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you have to fall down into a praying position. Not that there's anything wrong with being in that position. But there's nothing, about, there's nothing about physical movement or travel in that word. What's the idea now with come? You come to somebody who's present already. The idea is one of a heart matter. And, and listen to what he says. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. How do you come? How do you come spiritually? When it's not a matter that pertains to the physical. It doesn't pertain to my, my legs and my feet. Movement and travel. How, how do I spiritually go to Christ? Because obviously that's what this is all about. And we're talking about being saved. That's, that's what Patrick is asking about, right? He says, I'm lost. He says, I'm lost. He came to recognize he was lost. And he came to recognize that the Bible was true. But he knows he still lacks something. He's saying, I'm not sure how to run to Christ. Well, even that word, come, or that word, run, I mean, what do we think? Even, even drink. You know, it's all got physical imagery, but we know it's all spiritual. So how do we come in a spiritual sense? And I guarantee you, our eternal welfare rests on this answer. How about this again? Isaiah 55. Verse 1, come, everyone who thirsts. Did you notice what Jesus is doing when He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to Me? He said this, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, he's speaking to a certain type of people here. These are a people who are heavy laden. They have a burden. They labor. These are people that are weary. And he doesn't say exactly what they're weary with. But remember, he's a Savior. He saves from sin. People that are weary from sin. People that are weary from trying to save themselves. People that are weary from trying to clean up their own lives. People who are weary of trying to get to God by their own effort. People who have worked and worked and worked and worked. That's what labor is connected with. Work. People are just wore out. And he's saying, come to me. I'll give you rest. Because it's the very thing you're trying to work for. I've already accomplished and then Isaiah, come everyone who thirst. I, I mean, notice the descriptive nature of these verses. He's speaking to certain people in these verses. People that have certain heart issues. Again, we're talking about spiritual realities, not physical ones. Everyone who thirsts, not for water, 
all who labor and are heavy laden, not with physical work. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money. He's talking to the thirsty and to the broke. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Or how about this invitation out of John 6.37? Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. How about John 7.37? On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Matthew 11.28 Come. Isaiah 55.1 Come. And again, a second time. Come. John 6.37 Whoever comes, John 7, 37, come. Revelation 22, 17, the Spirit and the Bride. Here it's not Christ saying it. Here it's the Spirit and the church. They say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. These invitations sound very similar. Without price. You come with nothing to buy. He's speaking to the broke. He's speaking to the thirsty repeatedly. Thirst is a desire. There's a hunger for something. There's a thirst for something. There's a craving for something. Something's going on inside the person. They need something. They're looking for that rest. They're looking for for that which gets them away from the labor that they've been involved with. There's a thirst in the soul. They're longing for something. There's a burden that they're trying to escape. They have nothing to pay with, but they know they need something. And here's an invitation to come without price. How about this? John 4, verse 10. Jesus with the woman at the well He said this, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. Now here's a new word for us. Come is not in this verse, but ask. How do you come? How do we come? We come in the heart. We come spiritually. And we ask. You come to the Lord by asking. How about this? Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. That he may have, there the word is return. Sometimes we get turn in Scripture. The idea of repentance, coming to the Lord, giving up his wicked way, his unrighteous thoughts, and coming to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God. You come to our God. Again, We're not talking about any physical reality here. For He will abundantly pardon. Or how about this? Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He's near. There's a new word. Two new words. Seek and call. We find come. We find return. We find ask. We find seek. We find call. How do you seek? Where are you looking? You seek the Lord by asking, by calling. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near.
Now think with me. You call. What do you ask? How do you call? How do you approach the Lord when you would be saved? I mean, certainly this, this doesn't require any kind of certain phrase that we have to use that it and it alone is going to be effectual with the Lord as though a certain sequence of words or a certain set of words is kind of like the magic for approaching the Lord. I want you all to think about this because, because this is key. You think of the sinner and they're running. How do I run to Christ? How do I run to Christ? Well, He's near. You call upon the Lord while He's near. You call. He is near. That's how do you get to Him? You make an appeal to Him. You cry out to Him. You call. And now, now listen. In Romans chapter 10, and I want you all to turn here. Romans 10. I think this goes to the heart of, of why so many people so many people, they, they seem baffled by this. What do you mean run to Christ? What do I do? Well, you know what, he, you know what his problem is? I, I mean on the surface level, at least as far as his own mind is, is the cogs are turning in his mind, he says I've been reading the Bible. He says, I believe the Bible's true. He said, my prayers in the beginning seem to be genuine. You see what he's doing? He's reading Scripture, he's believing Scripture, and he's been praying. But it hasn't worked. And so, he's saying, what do I have to do to run to Christ? You see, in his mind, he's thinking, you, you can see what's happened. I've gone to the Word and I've prayed and nothing has happened. I mean, what do you do when people come to you and say that? What do we know is absolutely true if people come to us and say that? I know this is true. I know that God is no liar. And I know that He's promised in His Word to save sinners who seek Him. I know He's promised in Scripture to save sinners who ask Him. I know He's promised in Scripture to save those who call upon Him. I know that He's promised in Scripture that if you'll come to Him without price and drink, you will find eternal life. I know that from Scripture, and I know He's not lying. And the truth is that a lot of people in this room have found Him to be true to that Word. We came to Him, and He saved us. And so, what we know is this. No matter what man says, let man be a liar, right? Whatever man may say, if they claim they're doing what God says needs to be done in order for a sinner to be saved, repent and believe, to come, to return, to ask, to seek, to call. That if the sinner does that and they're not saved, we know God is true. We know the problem is not in God. And, we, and you know, we have to be careful. Because I've had people on the other end of the phone just weeping and weeping and weeping people in total frustration and you know you can go through it with your children too you can go through it with close family members you can go through it with people that you dearly love who are close to you 
and they tell you with tears streaming down their face, I'm calling on the Lord and He won't save me. And you've got to watch your own heart in the matter lest, lest you start to find fault with God. But you be sure of this. God is not a liar. And so I want you to think about this because I think I, I, I'm certain that this is at the heart of it. And you might be able to say this different ways. Somebody could approach this I undoubtedly from different directions. Other, other men, other women could, say, could probably say it differently or they could work off of different verses in trying to make this very same case. This isn't the only way to say what I think that the heart of the problem is. But this is one way of saying it. This is one way that I want you to see what the problem is. Notice Romans 10, 12. And it reads like this. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. There's our word again. All who call. How in a spiritual sense do you go to Christ? You call. You pray. This guy that's praying is on the right track. That's how you communicate. And whether it's verbal, like you're in the room with the person and you can hear them speak, it's audible to the eardrum, or whether it's a sigh, a groan that comes unspoken from the heart of man. If it's the desire of a man expressed internally or externally, that is a cry. That is a call. But watch. Just watch what happens here. Verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you know, I have been thinking about this verse. And I recognized, I recognized that I think there's something here that we often pass over. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you know that promise is certain? Did you, did you find any exceptions in there? This text is 100% true. Every time. Every time. It's a promise. You can bank your eternal soul on it. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts 2.21 It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Same truth. Acts 2.21 that you get in Romans 10.13 Everyone, both of them, dogmatically stated, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There it is. That is how you run to Christ. Everyone, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you want to know how to run to Christ savingly, this is it. Everyone. This is how to get to Him. This is how to savingly come to Christ. But I want you to know something here. I want you to notice something. The name of Jesus Christ. Now watch that. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
the name of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Why doesn't it just say everyone who calls upon the Lord? The name of the Lord. And I know these these two instances are not the only places where you find this kind of thing in Scripture. Think about this, 1 John 3.23. This is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. What is the significance of a name? Tell me about names. A name does what? What does a name do? Yeah, it, it identifies somebody. What's that? Yeah, it represents somebody. Your name represents you. And what's interesting is the name. The name represents who Christ is. When you think about the name of Christ, stop in the name of the law. Have you ever heard that said? I bring a message in the name of the King. The name would represent who they are. Everything about them. The authority that they have. The name. You call upon the name of Jesus Christ. And I think that's that's really important. Why? Because think about His name. I mean, you come into the Gospels. Think with me here. You come into the Gospels of the New Testament. Hear the Savior. He's incarnate. He's come into the world. The Word is made flesh. He's dwelling among us. And when a name is given to Him, right there at the beginning, Matthew hits us with two names. I mean, immediately in Matthew chapter 1, He's given two names. Can you remember what they are? Jesus and Emmanuel. And both names are defined for us. Why? Because a name represents the person. Call His name Jesus, which means Yahweh saves. Why? Because He will save His people from their sins. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see what a name encompasses, it encompasses the reality of that person. It is descriptive of that person. If I call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, then I'm calling upon everything that He is. And you know what the problem is? Running to Jesus Christ is all about calling on the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. But people don't call upon Him for who He is. That's the problem. Because you think with me here. Think with me about His name. His name, Jesus. Let's take that one first. You call upon the name of Jesus. Who are you calling upon? The one that Scripture says is going to save His people. Now, you know, what that, you know what that tells me right off? He's going to do it. You're not going to do it. That, that just resonates right back to the truth without price, right? Right? You don't bring anything. I'm the Savior, He says. I save my people from their sins. My people don't save themselves from their sins. I save them from their sins. Do you remember what He said? He said, those that are healthy don't need a doctor. In other words, I came to the... I I came into this world for those people that need a Jesus. Hear His name. 
Call His name Jesus, for He will save His people. People who call upon the name of Jesus, are call, they're people who they don't have any price. They're sick people. They're people that need the doctor. They're people that come empty. They're people that come without price. They're keep people that when they hear such an invitation, like we heard, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money. These are for, the, the name Jesus is for people that have nothing to offer. It's for people who are destitute and bankrupt. That's what the name Jesus is for. If you call upon the name of Jesus, you are being deceptive if you really want to lend a hand in your salvation. You are not honestly calling upon the Jesus that, it, that is displayed in Matthew chapter 1, the Christ who there says He's going to save His people from all their sin. You're not calling upon that Christ you're not calling upon the name of the Lord if you're coming thinking you can offer anything. And you say, what do people think that they can offer? All manner of things. People always want to offer things to God. I'm trying to repent. What's that? I mean, you're trying to save yourself. People are always trying to construct faith. Well, I'm trying to believe. I'm trying to repent. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. I hear that all the time. I'm trying to. Well, you're not destitute. You're not broke. You say, I, you're, I'm calling on the Lord. You're not calling on the Lord when you're trying to offer something. You're not. You're not calling. The name of the Lord. Think about the name of the Lord. I will save my people from all their sins. That's why they call Him Jesus. Call, you call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from all their sin. He's going to save them. You're not honestly calling upon His name if you're wanting to offer anything to it. If you've got any goodness, if you've been trying to do anything, if you don't come with your boasting lips shut, then you're not calling on the name of the Lord. You see, to call upon the name of the Lord means to call upon who to call upon that savior who is who he is as described by his name what his name is who everything that's represented by his name now you, you listen to this as well that it's not just that he will do the saving he says this the angel said that he's going to save his people from their sins. Did you hear what Patrick said? He says he keeps running to his sin. Jesus is going to save his people from their sin. Have you read? Sin shall have no dominion over you. Have you ever read? He's going to cleanse them from all their idols. Have you ever read? I thank God that you've become obedient from the heart. Have you read the kind of salvation? Think, think, think. Scripture says if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. How about this? Titus 2.14 Jesus Christ gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for Himself a people. To purify for Himself. Here's the thing. He says in one place, unless you renounce all all you have, you can't be my disciple. Renouncing doesn't mean that you end up floating in a vacuum with nothing but your soul. Renouncing doesn't mean that you don't have a shirt to wear or a dress to wear. 
Renouncing means I'm letting go of it all. Lord, take it all away. Take the sin away. Only give me what's good for me. Only allow me to keep what you know I can handle, what will be good for me, what will help me in purity and righteousness and uprightness and holiness, without which I know no man will see the Lord. You say that you're going to purify a people and sin's not going to have dominion over them and you're going to cleanse them from all their idols. And they're no longer going to be slaves to sin. And if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Remember the covenant that He made? He says He's going to put His law on our heart. We're going to keep it, right? He's going to cause us to walk in His statutes. When we come to Him, He's... He's Jesus. He's called Jesus because He's going to save His people from their sins. He's serious about it. You see, you can't come calling on the name of the Lord and not... Look, nobody's going to argue the fact that if you're not sincere about being saved, that you should wonder why you aren't, right? I mean, is there anybody here? Is there anybody anywhere that is going to think that if you ask insincerely that Christ is going to save you? That if you really don't want to be saved? Doing lip service to words like, I call upon you, or I call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. I mean, if you just do lip service, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. If that's just lip service, you know if you're not really sincere, He's not going to save you. You have to call upon the name of the Lord and call upon Him by His name in sincerity. And if His name indicates to us, He does all the saving. He doesn't share any of the saving with you. If that's the kind of Savior you want, where you don't want to lend a hand, where you're not ready to boast in your own achievements in it, if you want the kind of salvation that's all Him and none of you, if you recognize that's what you need, if if you're so labored and heavy laden because of all your efforts and you see that it hasn't taken you anywhere and all your efforts to run to Christ and all your efforts to construct some kind of faith or some kind of repentance and you're just wore out by it and you're to the place now where you're ready to call on the name of one who promises to do all the saving, then that's sincerely calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're to the place where You want to be saved. You you see, Scripture again and again says, if you will, come. If you want. If you desire. I mean, that's what the appeal is, right? If you're thirsty, that means desire. That means a will. If you're longing to be saved from your sin, but don't play games. His name is Jesus because He saves His people from their sin. If you come with even one idol that you, would, you don't want to be saved from, you're not being sincere in calling on the name of the Lord. Because His name, Jesus, means He's going to save you from all your sin. That's what it means. You call upon the name of of the Lord, you will be saved. I mean, if you call upon Him for what His name is, you will be saved. If that's what you want. But you better remember what kind of Savior you're dealing with. You're dealing with a Savior that does all the saving and you're dealing with a Savior who is intent to purify you and to redeem you and to cleanse you of every single idol, to break the grip of every single sin and to wash it away, and to purify you, and to get all the stains out, and to totally deliver you from everything. 
You've got to renounce and forsake and give everything to Him for Him to take away everything that's vile, everything that's ugly in your life. You've got to surrender it all. You hold on to anything wicked, anything sinful, anything that you don't really want to part with, you're not, you're not calling sincerely upon the name of the Lord. Because that's what His name means. And by the way, think about this. God with us. Emmanuel, again, there's, an, there's another name. You call upon the name of the Lord. You're calling upon the name of the one who plans to be with you. The God of Scripture plans to be with you. Not just, not just rescue from punishment. Not just rescue from sin. Not just rescue from hell. He's saying, I'll be with you. That's what Emmanuel's all about. The name represents who we are. He's saying, I'm coming in. I'm going to walk with you. Not the God of your imagination. The God of the Scriptures. Is that what you really want? I mean, I've, I heard one well-known preacher say, you know, if Jesus walked in here right now, he says he thinks he would make a lot of people really uncomfortable. Why? Because his demands. He expects that we're going to walk in his words. You, you'll prove to be his disciple if you... If His Word abides in you, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? Are you really ready for that God to be with you? That's what He says. Emmanuel, God with us. You think, are you really calling upon the God of Scripture because you want Him to be with you? That's who Christ is. He's God. He's God with us. But you remember what His name means. Do you really want that God with you? Do you really want one of that holiness with you? Is that the kind of Savior you want? Are you hoping to get a free pass out of hell? But you don't, the, the Christ of Scripture kind of concerns you. He's too rigid. He's too strict. He's too steep. He wants too much. He demands too much. You better believe He demands a lot. He demands it all, right? He, he does all the saving. He does all of it. But if you don't want to be saved from all that's wrong and wicked and evil in your life, then you're not being sincere. If you don't want the, the God of Scripture to be with you and to walk with you and to come into you and to purify you the way He is pure, then you're not being honest. You're not being honest with Scripture. You know, if you look and you see this, this ugly master of sin, this black, stained, foul master of sin. I don't want it anymore. I know I can't break it. I need somebody who's going to totally save me and I want to be saved from all of it. I want righteousness. Lord, come and save me. I'm not in any parlaying terms. I'm not on bargaining terms. I'm not ready to do any negotiation. You see, that's according to His name. He presents Himself that way. And, and so often sinners don't hear it. They do not hear what is meant by His name. They, they don't hear it. You call His name Jesus. He's, he's gonna save His people from their sin. Is that really what you want? I mean, you gotta, you've got to think. Is that really what you want? Because, because if you do lip service, Lord, save me, and all it is, is you started reading Scripture and you don't like the sound of eternal punishment. You're not, you're not being sincere. If you're sincere, He'll save you in a second. If you call upon Him for what His name is, you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You will. If you call upon Him for what His name is and for what it stands for, You'll be saved. That's how you run to Christ. You call upon Him for all that His name is. You're not playing games. So many sinners want to bargain. They want to bargain. Why do you think it says over and over and over and over in Scripture be not deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom. 
Be not deceived. You don't want to be hearers only and not doers. Why again and again Jesus and Paul and James and John. I mean, they're, why do they hit us with this again and again and again? Because people want to bargain with God. They want to hold something back. There's that precious idol. And they, they hear that Jesus saves and they like the thought of being saved from hell. But He doesn't say there that He's going to save from hell. It says they called His name Jesus because He's going to save His people from their sin. From their sin. Sin is the great enemy, not hell. Sin. That's what you need to be saved from. If that's what you want to be saved from, there is a Savior to save sinners from sin. And He says, I came to seek and save the lost. Not the well. Not the righteous. He didn't come to seek and save those who don't need saving. He came to seek and save the lost. Those who want a Savior. Those who recognize I need a Savior. Those who recognize they're in the bondage of sin and they can't get out. They can't break the chain. And they want to be saved from all of it. Not for some of it. They don't want to bargain and they don't want to negotiate. They need a Savior to save them from all of it. All of it. Anything impure. Anything ugly. Anything stained. Anything black. Anything that's foul and filthy. Wretched in them. Anything that God is displeased with. They need a Savior to come save them from that. They want the Christ of Scripture to be with them. They want God with us. They want that. They want Him to come and be with them. They want Him to come and be with them to save them from all sin. They want Him to come. They want whatever keeps them from being able to draw near to God being taken away. God with us. Not somebody that wants an imitation. You see, everybody wants a Savior. Everybody wants a Savior that's going to keep them out of hell and let them keep their sin. Everybody wants that Savior. And so, guess what? The devil comes along and guess what the message of all the false religion out there says? We've got a way to get you in and you can still keep your idols. And that's why Scripture repeatedly has to say, be not deceived, because that is the great deception. And you can call upon the Lord and you can seek to run to the Lord and you can do all your acrobatics and you can try and try and try and try. And you can seek to come and you can seek to seek and you can ask and you can pray and you can get in the Bible and you can do all sorts of things. And, and typically these people, they call one person and then they call another person and then they email this person and then they go to that person, they go to that person, they go to that person and another person, another person. I've had people that have called me again and again and again and again. James was just telling me some guy 20 times. I've seen this again and again and again. I've had people call me and I'll ask them and they've called other people and they've already talked to James 20 times. And they've called Paul Washer and they've done this and done that and they've called all over and still, what are they doing? What are they looking for? I'll tell you what they're looking for. They keep asking and asking and asking and asking and asking and they're not getting saved. Why? Because, and they're looking for some new thing. Tell me some new thing. What they really want is they want you to tell them how they can escape hell and still keep their sin and suddenly have peace and rest in their conscience and in their soul. And it's not coming. And you can tell them the same thing that everybody else, that you've already told them 20 times, and James already told them 20 times, and everybody else has told them 20 times. But what they don't want is the Savior as He's offered in Scripture. Because that Savior offered in Scripture promises that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. You will if you want that Savior 
who's backed up by that name. You think about what His name is. You think about what His name means. You think about what that name indicates, the kind of Savior that we have. I mean, you find, the, you find right in Scripture, I dealt with it last Thursday over at Our Lady of the Lake. There's, there's this tax collector. Think about it. He won't even look up to heaven. The Pharisee, he's reciting. You, know, you can hear it, the guy that calls me. I'm trying to repent. I'm trying to believe. Do you know how much that sounds like the Pharisee in Luke 18? I fast twice in a week. I give tithe of all that I make. That's exactly what it... He doesn't need a Savior. He's doing a good enough job trying to save himself. Here's this tax collector. He won't even look up to heaven. He stands far off. Why? He knows he's polluted. He knows I don't have anything to offer. I need the kind of Savior that I can come to as a bankrupt. The gas gauge is on E. I don't have anything left. There's not even fumes. I'm on E. I need the kind of Savior to save me from all my sin. I don't want to hold on to anything. It's killing me. It's a pollution to my soul. I know God hates it. I'm filthy in His sight. I need to be made clean from all of it. I want God to be with me. And I know I sense it in the depths of my soul. He's far off. I'm not worthy to draw near to Him. I tell you, that man went home justified. That man successfully ran to Christ. How about another one? Here's a thief. He's hanging on a cross. His hours are numbered. The minutes of his life are ticking away. He's hanging there next to Christ on that cross. And he recognizes. My life, my life is just ruins. I deserve what I'm getting. I deserve this. I'm a criminal. I'm not a good person. I'm a criminal. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, you'll be with me this day in paradise. You see, he needed a, a savior. He needed a savior to save him from all of his sins. He needed a savior to do the saving for him. He wanted the kind of Savior that Christ was and He wanted Him to be with Him. And Christ said, you're going to be. You're going to be with me in paradise. I'll tell you this. Jesus Christ simply did not come to save some people. He came to save the kind of people that need a Savior like He is. You know the, the DVD that we had made? There's, there's a clip about halfway through that where Paul Washer's talking about the cross. I don't remember what that clip was called. It's one of my favorites. And as he's wrapping up, 
He says, one of you might be asking, can I be saved? And he says, well, I don't know. That depends. You know, the problem is, Being saved with nothing in your hand, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. That is the simplest way to be saved. And yet it is just utterly impossible if you're determined to bring something in that hand. Can can you be saved? Can I run to Christ? You can. He freely invites you to come if you'll take Him as the Savior that He is. To be saved the way He saves. It's altogether glorious if you don't have anything to offer. But men in their pride don't want to be saved that way. Why few there be that find it? Because most men will not come destitute. Because that's that's to come humble and contrite. When a man comes, a woman comes, and they say, I have nothing to offer, that's a low posture. But see, men are full of pride. Most men are going to miss heaven because they won't stoop as far as it takes to stoop. And even that sounds like an effort. Maybe falling into a... Most men won't just fall into a puddle of nothingness into the arms of Christ. They want something to offer. They want to be able to provide part of it. They want to be able to take part and take place. But to just crumble at the feet of the cross into nothingness that Christ might be all. That He might be be the perfect Savior. That He might do all the saving. We come to Him with nothing in our hands. Needing Him. Needing Him. Christ is only going to save those that need Him. And that's what He says. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Those who are well have no need of a physician. He came to save those who need Him. And this is the problem. There are those people, I'm trying to run to Christ, but He won't save me. This is why. I'm trying to come to Christ, but He won't save me. This is exactly the issue. It's always the issue. They're not calling upon the name of the Lord for all that that means. If you call upon the name of the Lord, it means you call upon the Lord for what His name means. For all that His name is. You look at the names of Christ and you can see what sort of Savior He is. He's not, the, he's not the kind to share the glory. He's, he's the Savior. You, that means you're not, He is. He came to seek and save the lost. That means you're lost. You're lost. You don't know how to get back. You're wandering. Out there in the wilderness, you're just lost. You're just a lost and roaming and destitute, wandering star out there in the darkness. You need help. 
You need total help. And see, his, his cry rings out through the ages. And for those whose ear can hear and say, oh, that, that is the kind of Savior I've been looking for. Then he says, come. I offer you to drink without price. And you can run right over and grab hold spiritually. You just ask, Lord, help me. And He'll come in right away and help you. And if He doesn't, there's only one explanation. The fault and the failure is in you. And it's because you're really not coming to Him as He is. And you're not seeking Him as He is. And you're not calling upon His name as He is. You're not running to Him for who He is. You want a different kind of Savior. You want a different kind of Christ. You can call the name verbally of Jesus or Christ. But if your desire is not for what that name means, you're not being sincere. You're looking for a different kind of Savior than what God sent into this world. God sent a Savior for the lost, for the burdened, for the heavy laden, for the sick, for those that don't have price, for the destitute and the bankrupt, for those like the tax collector who all they can do is beat on their breast and say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And that man went home justified. And this is it. I mean, when you, when you come across people who seem frustrated, people who weep tears because they're not being saved, you need to be real clear about exactly the kind of of Savior that Christ is and what His name means. What it is to call upon the name of the Lord. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen.